So we'd like to thank the uh, organizer to invite me and uh, Sean uh, asked me to talk about spatial networks. I'm an ecologist, I'm using uh, mostly connectivity in my work based on network theory and lately I've been very interested in uh, genetic for quantifying connectivity uh, based on gene flow. So uh, a lot of my work is in a collaboration with uh, Ellen Wagner and this is a kind of classification of how we analyze data. So if we are thinking of network, we are in space here, those are location. I did my research in boundary detection to find a, a different grouping, but we can look at similarities, uh, FSTs between location and you can be at the uh, site level and neighboring level. So different statistics analysis framework can be used depending on your question. And here in another book chapter, we kind of characterize uh, different ways in which you may be interested in selection or gene flow. And mostly I'm going to talk about gene flow because it's connectivity, is movement between one patch to another. So what is a graph? Uh, it's a mathematical object where we have two entities, the nodes, which is the point of interest when we want to know the interaction between nodes and those interaction is based on those link that we are positioning between those objects. So here would be population and gene flow between those. So there's a different property of graphs. So graph can be undirected. So we have the nodes and the links between them. We can have flow directionality. And the most basic statistic about graph is the degree of the node. So the degree of the node is telling me how many neighbors I have in this network. And the nodes in the center always have more neighbors than on the edges. Uh, to find networks, there's a lot of causalities that bring us to kind of uh, spatial or phylogeny or ecological network. So there's evolution, there's species interaction, there's spatial temporal things, trait. So there's all those aspects and that's bring us to some network that we are trying to address, measure, and to understand. Those in uh, genetic are more used to see a graph in terms of a tree. So a tree phylogeny is a graph that is rooted. And here, myself, uh, with a former student of mine, we were interested in looking at the speciation along maybe a elevation gradient, giving different types of resources or climatic conditions. So you can have different trees, those in the phylogeny and in the spatial structure. So as I said, I'm interested in connectivity. So from an ecological perspective, we oppose what we call structural connectivity to functional connectivity. Structural is just the layout of the patches, uh, the green, dark green or forest, and the animal will move or not between those patches. So this actual connectivity is a function of the structure of the patches and the behavior a dispersal ability of the animal. So we will call that potential functional connectivity unless if we have real colors where we know exactly where the animal moved, then it will be the real connectivity. And uh, the point is that the animal can move, but is it uh, uh, having an exchange of gene flow? We don't know. So that's why we need to assess genetic connectivity, which is a function of the actual connectivity plus the exchange of genes. So what are the things that will affect connectivity? So in fact, my connectivity is maybe not your connectivity. So there's, like I said, the structural connectivity, the functional from the animal. There's maybe hydrology. I work with marine protected areas. So we need to address the current ocean movement. And then there's the genetic connectivity. And all those aspects will create this kind of generic connectivity that integrate all those processes. So we can test hypotheses, uh, inference. We can have a kind of null hypothesis that uh, all the uh, maybe population can interact, uh, exchange gene with all the others. So that would be our null hypothesis. And then we can say, no, there's some uh, gene flow more intense in some relation 
maybe the uh, animals are affected by the resistance of movement in the landscape due to some kind of uh, uh, different habitats. And then uh, we can have more maybe directionality and a barrier. So we can test isolation by distance, isolation by resistance, and isolation by barrier with a network framework. We can also look at the node, maybe adaptation. So we can see the null hypothesis again is that the weight, there's no weight at the nodes. And maybe there's some kind of properties of the location that make the species adapted to some location. And from a spatial arrangement, maybe some patches of landscape are bigger or larger or having more quality that favor the adaptation. As I said, I'm working in uh, trying to establish marine protected area. So in ocean, there's different kind of maybe uh, uh, models of gene, gene flow between the different locations. So here, let's see, this is the coastline and those are my different marine protected areas of different sizes. So do you have the retention in marine protected area and then the exchange to the biggest uh, marine protected area there. So that would be the island model. You can have the stepping stones, so you change gene within your protected area, but with the adjacent one. You can have the small world kind of behavior so that you could go at different distances. And in my case, I think it's uh, I'm working in uh, the coast of BC, so uh, south north, so there's a big current. So I think it's a change of directionality that uh, propagate the larvae and the retention and nearby um, exchange of genes from one protected area to another. So we need to think of what is our hypothesis of movement and then try to address that and see how one marine protected area is more important than another. So we can do what we call a, a patch importance or here it would be a, a marine protected area importance analysis is kind of a jackknife. So we compute a statistic uh, giving all the marine protected areas and then we remove one, we compute again the statistic and we see how much that particular uh, marine protected area was uh, crucial to maintain maybe the gene flow or the movement of animal from one location to another. So we can also remove another one and put them back. So we do this iteratively and we can have a, a ranking of which uh, area node is more important. We can remove one, like I said, but we can remove uh, a group. I uh, don't remember now, I think it's Dan who mentioned that maybe in the ecological space, maybe they all in the same location. So maybe one specific a group of species that were in that location got uh, this, the habitat got destroyed, so we lost completely that genetic group. So we can test that. We can remove a group of area and see how this group was important for maintaining the diversity or the genetic diversity. I'm going fast because I'm sure you're hungry. Uh, so then the thing is in the landscape genetic, we are opportunistic, we are poor, and we go to location where we think we have information, but maybe we don't have all the information, we just have a sample. So we don't have all the location of where all the individuals are. So we need to know that in uh, network theory, we expect that we have indeed all the nodes of interest are known, but with our sample, maybe we are missing uh, you know, some location like here, we don't have location one and four. We missed them. We didn't have the information. And then are we including all the link between all the location or are we doing a minimum spanning tree or are we looking at the dispersal ability from one location to another? So we need to understand the property of the network and what is the implication if we don't have sample everything and if we don't have all the links to relate the genetic information. I have no clue why I showed this again, but I guess, yes, I do. Sorry. <laughs> so sometimes uh, you want to also uh, look at adaptation and not just the gene flow. So there is a kind of bridge in your interest. You want to say, well, I know that local adaptation or 
adaptation occur at those locations and there is on top of it some kind of gene flow. So we could look at that through a kind of analysis that we did in collaboration of all those very nice people that gave us genetic data. This is uh, based on the uh, distributed graduate seminar that Lisette is uh, the main engine under this uh, group of people that uh, each other years throughout the globe are teaching landscape genetic. And we use this data from uh, Colorado on this little, little frog to look at the uh, potential genetic diversity and how the spatial temporal changes in the uh, snow male will affect the genetic signature of this little frog. So this little frog uh, was sampled at 18 pounds. There was 12 uh, microsatellites. And we wanted to see, well, maybe the genetic variability is more due to the location, how much precipitation, and the topography between ponds also maybe is important for the gene changes from one location to another. So to address this, we use what we call gravity model that is assessing both information at the pond, so the amount of water, precipitation, and the link is the movement, the ease of movement from one pond to another. The genetic uh, index that we use was the proportion of shear allele. And this is the spaghetti that link all the potential um, movement between all those 18 uh, ponds. But if you recall, I go back, this is a very small frog. So that frog cannot move that far. Uh, this is the scale. And in fact, the frog can move only 600 meters. So basically, those long links are impossible. So this is the functional connectivity of the uh, frog. So at uh, 600 meter, this is all again uh, kind of stretch dispersal ability. So the, whoops, sorry, the lower part are connected, but definitely this one is isolated by itself in the north. So the gravity model, just to show an equation, we have a response variable that would be our uh, proportion of shear allele, and all those things is to account for the source and sync. So the gravity model, the kind of message about it is that you have maybe some attraction power to go from one pond to another. Maybe there's a better quality, uh, better resources, something in, like this one is a big one, so maybe they all want to go there. This one is a small one, so it's more a sink. I want to get out of it. So there's kind of ways to assess the attractiveness of each pond and the resistance of movement between them. So we decided to look at how important the spatial layout, the spatial network between the um, ponds was. And like I said, this was the dispersal ability. So this was the functional uh, dispersal of the frogs. And like I said, this is by itself. Then we wanted to say, well, why is an animal moving? So basically, uh, sorry, I need to go back. Um, so the connectivity that we're interested in is based on functional uh, connectivity, the dispersal ability. But maybe I don't need to go far if I have a good quality. If I have a big patch, why should I go out? So Santiago Sora and his group uh, computed this kind of probability of connectivity measure that can be decomposed in three kind of uh, index. So, whoops, sorry. The intra is that the patch is so big, my pond is so big, why should I go out? There's no reason to go out. So my connectivity is in fact to stay in my patch. So the uh, contribution to connectivity from this patch is the fact that it's big and I'm just going to stay in it. So it's good quality patches. The flux is the 600 meter ability of my frog to move from one location to another. And then the stepping stone is this uh, H patch here that if I remove this pond, this group of ponds cannot move to the other part of the landscape. So this pond is a stepping stone to move in the landscape. So to make a story short, you can read the papers. Uh, <laughs> 
we use this to see how our different 18 ponds were contributing to the connectivity. So on the left, bigger are the circle, more connectivity there is. Those are very not contributing more to the most to the connectivity. But then we separated in those three categories where in fact, the connectivity from all of those here is mostly due to the dispersal availability, the flux, and the one by itself, the contribution is, as we expected, is by its size, the intra. So this was space, but we had also the effect of, in this region of the snow mill that will change the uh, quality of the ponds. In some years, if there's not much uh, snow, there won't be a pond there because the snow is bringing enough water to maintain the ponds through the season. So this is just a cartoon to illustrate that, that we have some ponds, there's some string that connect them at the, in the spring, and by the summer, some ponds that disappear. So we wanted to capture this kind of dynamic, not just through a season, but through the years. So we, we use uh, snow data melt information this is in, uh, from a long time series, and we make a cut that everything that was lower than 25 inches of snow that was not going to maintain ponds through all the years, if some will be unchanged and some will be having a favorite occurrence by having a lot of snow during the summer. So we reclassify our ponds, but each year will be different. This is one year. Uh, those will have not changed. Some will be favored by um, the low amount of uh, snow will make them disappear. And if there's a lot of uh, snow, those will appear. And we c catalog that for each year and create a new temporal network. So now the size of the contribution to the connectivity change, those stay the, mo the same, but these were more connecting uh, especially previously. And what we see now is that the uh, flux is mostly in this neighborhood and some of here, but mostly now the connectivity importance is due to the size of the ponds. Okay, so that was nice, but this is a very long distance and we had only 18 ponds. So maybe in fact, there's a lot of ponds in the between that we have not studied. So we use what we call a suitable kind of network. So now in, bl in blue is all the other possibility of networks, uh, ponds that can be there. And there was hundred of them. So basically now we create a new map where the connectivity is based on this kind of stepping stone. We add the ponds that this PC would use. And indeed now we see much more green. We see the connector in blue that did not exist and some that still just because of their size. So we massage all of this into our gravity model and to our surprise, <laughs> networks were not important. So the most important part uh, was the uh, precipitation at the sides and the relief between them. But between uh, a delta AIC of two, the network with uh, the, this one, the stepping stone suitable habitat was also good. So this is just to show that networks are appealing. Are they always uh, useful? I think uh, just the space of the 18 uh, sample in this case was not useful. The temporal one was not as useful. Is this stepping stone stop through the way that the species can use that was? And um, because this is about genetic, um, there is a series of use of graph in uh, uh, so genetic based on those population graph come from Ram Dyer work. I would not explain them, but they are uh, used and they can be, this is in the genetic space and they can be mapped then after in, in space. And then you can have those kind of different edges that you can see the relative importance. So space is important. Space can be created by different aspects of landscape ecology, population genetic, and in landscape genetic, people are trying to address the effect of spatial heterogeneity on the gene flow and selection.